Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the President's Lecture Series, which is part of the Shepherd University Lifelong Learning Program under the directorship of our wonderful Karen Rice. We are delighted to learn that the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for 2017 will be awarded to three senior researchers who spent more than 20 years uncovering the mechanisms of the body's natural 24-hour circadian rhythms, a very important topic for those of us who want to stay awake during the day and go to sleep at night. <laughs> so this afternoon, we are privileged to hear from Dr. Jeffrey Plautz, who worked with one of the distinguished Nobel laureate team members while conducting his own PhD research in biology at the University of Virginia and also at the Scripps Research Institute. Dr. Plautz helped to pioneer some important findings on the circadian clock at the intersection of genetics and behavior. Working on his project in collaboration with one of the future Nobel laureates during the peak of the discovery period resulted in several preeminent publications in this space, and it contributes to our body of knowledge on the ubiquity and inner workings of this critical clock. In the 20 years since that heyday, Dr. Plautz has worked in scientific publishing with Highwire Press, where he's been able to improve the dissemination of scientific literature while keeping up with further advances in this exciting field. His talk is entitled, Time Flies, an inside look at the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, and will focus on the biological foundations of our sleep-wake cycle, along with glimpses into the brilliant and highly competitive personalities he experienced and encountered while working on Nobel Prize winning research. Following this lecture, we will have a reception in the lobby, which is generously sponsored by the Shepherd University Foundation. I would like to thank all of you for taking the time and interest to join us this afternoon. It's a little rainy, but that's okay. And I just want to tell you that we are being filmed because of the topic and because of the interest for so many people. So thank you very much. Jeffrey? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming out on, on a rainy day to hear about one of my favorite things to talk about, the circadian rhythms. So in the mid to late 1990s, I did my PhD graduate research on circadian rhythms, the body's 24-hour rhythms, in Drosophila. It's the common fruit fly. You can see the little guy right there, uh, almost life-size. <laughs> uh, wonderful organism. I had a, a lot of fun doing this work, and uh, hope today I'll be able to tell you a little bit more and the personalities behind the Nobel Prize and uh, not accelerate your sleep cycle too, too much going into it. So we'll jump right in, talking about the Nobel Prize itself. Uh, Nobel Prize was established through the will of Alfred Nobel's back in the early 1900s. And for physiology or medicine, you can see the first quote coming from his will, that it'd be annually distributed in the form of prizes to those who shall have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind, one part to the person who shall have made the most important discovery within the, the domain of physiology or medicine. So that was the original intent. Uh, that's sort of grown from what Alfred Nobel envisioned originally. So he had talked about having it go to one person. Uh, now the Nobel Prize Committee has expanded that to, to three. It can be not more than three, so it might be uh, you know, one or two, depending on the year and what was discovered. <laughs> And also, the original stipulation was to be given for research done in the past year. Uh, as research has become bigger, that really hasn't been so practical. So the Nobel Committee has, has uh, tweaked that understanding to be research that has been appreciated in the past year for being really dramatic and groundbreaking. So two weeks that that's been expanded. Uh, the laureates are selected by a committee. And that committee gets its input from nominations. The nominations are given by about 3,000 scholars uh, throughout the world. The scholars are going to vary from, from year to year. But if you do ever win a Nobel Prize of your own, you're automatically allowed to nominate for the rest of your life. Uh, as I said before, not more than three 
Well, in, in uh, physiology and medicine, 214 laureate since 1901. That's been about an average of one and a half, a little bit more, one and a half laureates per year. Um, recipients must be alive, and that's usually the case. Uh, there, there are a few exceptions. There's, there's been uh, two cases where recipient, where, where nominees have been selected for their prize, but then between the time when they were selected, which is around October, and the time that the prizes are awarded in December, they died, unfortunately. And in those cases, the committee decided to still go ahead and award posthumously for those two recipients. But otherwise, in general, you have to stay alive. Uh, probably the biggest, the biggest uh, stretch that anybody ever, ever did was a physicist who was awarded the Nobel Prize in the 1980s for work that he did in the 1930s. So he really had something to live for. <laughs> and uh, while it's a wonderful honor to get a Nobel Prize, it's also financially lucrative. Uh, in this year, 2017, the, each Nobel Prize is worth a little bit more than $1.1 million. And that money is split up among the laureates, if there is more than one. And the Nobel Committee can decide to not split it equally. So if there was three winners, for example, they could give half the money to one person and split the other half among the other two people. Uh, that didn't happen this year. This year, all three recipients are splitting the money equally. Uh, there's been a few controversial Nobel Prizes over, over the years. Um, there's, there's been some, as I said, you can have no more than three. And with science getting bigger, and especially in fields like astrophysics or genomics, where you could have hundreds of people working across dozens of labs, it can be difficult to decide exactly which three people of that are most worthy of the Nobel Prize. So there's been cases where people have gone up and accepted the Nobel Prize, but said, you know, the three of us are not the only ones who should get it. Um, no information on actually if they actually back that up by sharing the money or not. But there, there's uh, also some indication that some really big projects, for example, the Human Genome Project, um, you, it might not, we might not ever see a Nobel Prize come out of that. It's wonderful work, but selecting only three people to get the Nobel Prize is difficult. Um, also, the Nobel Prizes need to be uh, viewed in the context If we look at the procedure for frontal lobotomies, that was awarded the Nobel Prize in medicine. And at the time, it was groundbreaking research. However, now, uh, with more knowledge and history, uh, that's not really viewed as a valid treatment. And uh, some people might even say it's cruel or barbaric. So you have to, you have to view it. But um, just in any, in any of these cases, though, the work that was done was, at the time, groundbreaking. And it really has withstood the test of time. So moving on to this year, the 2017 laureates, uh, three laureates, the Nobel Prize, and from, this is from their announcement, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine 2017 was awarded jointly to Jeffrey C. Hall, Michael Rossbash, and Michael W. Young for their discoveries of molecular mechanisms controlling the circadian rhythm. So these are the three guys. Uh, Jeff Hall here. Got his PhD in 1971, uh, did his postdoc at Caltech, and Caltech is going to be a recurring theme for Nobel Prizes since it's one of the top institutions in the world in all of history to be associated with Nobel Prize uh, worthy research. Uh, he did that in the lab of Seymour Benzer, who was a very prolific man himself, uh, doing great research for many, many decades. Um, in 1974, he finished up his postdoc and went on to become a professor at Brandeis University. Just to give an indication of how different things were in 1974, uh, he was able to go to Brandeis and after his postdoc and get a professorship without having a single publication out of his research. Uh, it was the, the quality of the work that he did and the environment that, that was able to get him where he needed to be. Uh, Jeff Hall is also the, the uh, researcher who I work most closely with. We, we publish jointly uh, many papers. Uh, in the middle, we have Michael Rossbash. He got his PhD in 1970, went on, did a three-year postdoc, and then also started at Brandeis University also in 1974. He and Jeff Hall were in the same incoming class of professors at Brandeis. And they, they were friends right from the beginning and uh, were working together fairly closely. Finally, Michael Young got his PhD in 1975, did his postdoc at Stanford, uh, just up the coast a little bit from Caltech, so definitely aware of what was going on down there. And then in 78, he moved on to Rockefeller University in New York, York where he's a professor there and has been ever since. Uh, the, these 
very interesting gentleman. I got to know Jeff Hall quite well. Uh, the other two I, I knew peripherally through the work. Um, Jeff Hall was remarkable in that he was very driven, is still very driven. And he's the only person that I've ever met that's, that's had a true, genuine photographic memory where he could, he could read a paper one time, recall every fact in that paper, and then when you were discussing the paper, he would not only be able to recall the facts, but he would be able to say, you know, this point was on page three of the paper in the right column in the second paragraph. And this, this was everything he read. Uh, it's probably, I would imagine living that way is both a blessing and a curse. Um, apparently, apparently he's made it work, though. Um, Michael Rossbash was, is also very driven. Um, you know, don't tell him I, I did find him a little bit of bacon at times. <laughs> but but it, kind of that very focused, I think, on, on getting the work done. And uh, Michael Young, def definitely a, a very nice guy. Um, also smart and driven, but in, in a d very distinct way. Uh, in preparation for this talk, I reached out to, um, to these guys to ask some questions. Um, when I sent the email to Mike Young, even though I hadn't been in touch with him for 20 years, within six hours of me sending the email, he was already gotten back to me. Um, answering all the questions that I had and more. He was just really a genuinely nice guy. So they got their, their Nobel Prize for circadian rhythms. So let's talk about a little bit what circadian rhythms are. It comes from the Latin circa meaning about and dian meaning day. So it's rhythms that happen about once a day. Uh, there's other kind of biological rhythms. You could think of something very fast, like your heart beating that happens rhythmically, but much faster than a day. That happens obviously once a year, much longer than a day. It's the circadian rhythms that, that we're concerned about. And these, can, these circadian rhythms provide an adaptive advantage. They've been found in virtually every organism that anybody's cared to look in. And as far as the adaptive advantage goes, you can imagine if you're, if you're a mouse, um, things want to eat. And so it's going to be better if you go out and get your food at night when it's harder for things to, to see um, where you are. But then on the other hand, evolve to also be active at night and they evolve also their eyes to be more useful at night. Um, you can imagine plants, some, some flowers bloom at night, some bloom at the day. And the animal, well, the insects primarily that go around and pollinate those plants are going to also co-evolve to be active in the night or in the day. It's not useful to be active 24 hours a day when your food, for example, is only out there 12 hours a day. It's, it's not a biologically efficient process. So there's three main parts to the whole circadian clock story. There's the inputs, the outputs, and the central oscillator. So the central oscillator is the, the watch in the middle of everything. That's what's, that's what's keeping the time. Um, you can think of that as the extra gears behind what's going on. There's the inputs, and the inputs are the things that affect the, the central oscillator but are not part of it. So using the watch analogy, that could be things like the battery that keeps it running, or it could be the stem on your watch that lets you set what time it is. And finally, there's the outputs. The outputs are what you can see happening because of the rhythms. Um, for the watch analogy, again, that would be the hand on the clock. So when you look at your watch, you don't, you don't see all the little gears in, in there behind it. You just see the hands that are moving. That's the part that, that is most useful and most visible. But it doesn't really tell you how the watch itself works. So just to draw a distinction, circadian rhythms, which are for our cycles that we see, are driven by biological clocks. So that's the, the clock is the actual central timekeeper. That's sort of a, a distinction, but it can become important. There's four main points to a biological clock. So the biological clock first, it must maintain rhythmicity and constant conditions. Um, using the example of the flowers that open up their flowers at, some, at times of day and then close them in the night. Uh, if you take that flower and put it in constant darkness, it would still need to open and close rhythmically even though the sun isn't shining on it. That would indicate that it's a biological clock-driven process as opposed to just a response to sunlight that's making that process happen. Second, it must have a period of about 24 hours. There's some theoretical reasons why it's not always going to be exactly 24 hours that have to do with resetting it, but um, it's that 24-hour period that makes it circadian. Third, the clock must be the, when the clock is sudden 
can be reset by light to uh, be most useful for the organism. And then finally, the clock has to not be temperature dependent. Because if you had a clock that was temperature dependent, now it wouldn't be a clock anymore, it would just be a thermometer. And, and that, that's really relevant for something like, like our little just friend here, because he's not warm-blooded. And if the, if the rhythm, speed of the rhythm, differed when it was 50 degrees versus when it was 100 degrees, then the rhythm wouldn't really be useful, because the, the 24-hour cycle is going to happen irrespective of temperature. So those four, those four features are going to define the biological clock. things didn't quite transfer over as pretty as I had hoped. But I had subtitled this talk, um, How to Win Out a Nobel Prize in Six Easy Steps. I did pick up some advice from working with these laureates, so I'll, I'll share what I learned, and hopefully that'll be enough for everybody here to go out and get their own Nobel Prizes. <laughs> Step one is to stand on the shoulders of giants. So science and research is not done in a vacuum. And there's a whole huge world of, of information out there that people have found. And it's only by taking advantage of what others have done can we move forward. So if you had to start everything over from scratch, obviously no way that you could make any meaningful contributions. You have to take advantage of what other people have done and then build on that and move it forward. That's what everybody can do to advance science as a whole. So we'll step back now to some of these giants in circadian biology. Back in uh, 1729 was the first reported paper on circadian biology, where Jean-Jacques Dortus de Marianne described circadian mimicity in plants. And he was the one who did the example that I was talking about earlier, where he looked at the mimosa plant. Uh, that, that plant opens up, in the, uh, opens up in the night, and he took that and put it in a dark room and was able to find that even when there was no external cues, that the, the flowers would open and close on a rhythmic basis. Uh, we'll fast forward now to Drosophila genetics, uh, Drosophila again being, being these fruit flies. And Drosophila genetics is important because Drosophila, these fruit flies, in my opinion, is about the perfect model system for working on. Uh, they're small, they're easy to take care of. They've got about a two week generation, uh, so you can do easy genetics on them. They, you can make many generations to do genetic experiments over the course of a relatively short period of time. They've got a, a fairly complex genome. Uh, they've, they've got enough genes to make them very interesting. They're not so many genes that they're not approachable. And almost all the genes that they have have um, analogous genes or in uh, high organisms like mice or people. And then finally, these flies, they do have behavior. You know, most people look at them, and if they don't swat them, they, they just see the fly crawling around. But, but flies really, really do have interesting behavior. And it's some of their behavior that we'll talk about in some of the tests that were done. Uh, in 1960, roughly, a um, scientist named Colin Pittendrick and, and some of his co-workers basically laid the, the groundwork for chronobiology, where they did a lot of theoretical work, looked at, at different rhythmic behaviors in plants and animals, and uh, looked at how their behaviors were influenced by light, the way that light would, would shift. Basically, they were looking at, at jet lag. With jet lag, if you, if you fly uh, over to Europe or even out to California or something, uh, when light is hitting you in a different time than what you expect, that, that can make you feel kind of lousy for, for a few days while everything gets caught up. It was uh, Pittendrick and, and the rest that, that really formalized the work of, of phase advances, phase delays, and, and uh, figuring out the, you know, basically the theory. But they didn't have the tools to really figure out why these things were working. The tool, the hunt for the tools, really started in 1971 when uh, Ron Kanapka was working in the lab of Seymour Benzer at Caltech. And you can recall that uh, we said that Jeff Hall was working in Seymour Benzer's lab also. Uh, he was there at the same time that, that Ron Kanapka was working as a grad student. They were able to isolate the period gene in Drosophila. So period being the first gene that was ever found that was able to have a direct influence on the behavior of an organism. And that was really exciting because it's you know, finally we've got we've got a gene, just one little piece of DNA, that is able to affect the behavior of an entire animal. And the way that Ron Kanapka did this was he took flies and gave them a special kind of poison that made very 
small, distinct mutations in DNA. Not a whole lot of mutations, just, just a very few per animal. And they took those, those newly mutagenized flies and bred them out, uh, made some stable mutant lines, and then looked at how they eclosed. So eclosion is part of the Drosophila life cycle. So you can see that the flies have, they become little maggots, basically. And, and then they grow up to become pupae. And that's basically like uh, the equivalent of a caterpillar going in, into its cocoon. And after a couple days as a pupa, the fly will eclose or come out. And uh, Colin Pittendrick, who we just talked about before, had found that the eclosion of these Drosophila was a circadian rhythm-dependent phenomenon. Even though it only happens one time in the life of each animal, as a population, it's circadianly driven, where the flies like to come out in the morning. Uh, the, probably the reason for that is because when flies first eclose from their pupil case, they're kind of moist, uh, they're kind of shriveled up, and with humidity being highest, dew being highest in the morning, and just stop. Drosophila literally translates into lover of dew. Um, they tend to come out in the morning. That gives them the, the best survival. So Ron Kanapka took these mutant lines. He had hundreds and hundreds of bottles of mutant flies. And the way he worked his experiment was every day he would come into the lab and look at all the bottles of flies. And he expected in the morning to see each bottle full of flies. Then he would take the bottle, dump out all the flies. There would still be more, more new pupae that were he would empty it out, and then at night, before he went home, he would look at all these bottles of flies again. And he would expect that there wouldn't be any flies in those bottles, because remember, they all come out in the morning. They're not going to come out in the evening. So that's, that's what you would see in a normal population of flies. Within about the first 200 bottles, though, that he screened, he got lucky. He found some bottles of flies that, that the flies were there in the morning, but they were also there in the evening. And that gave him an indication that there was something off in the circadian rhythms of these flies. So he went on and did some more experiments and was able to isolate the period gene. As I said, it was generated by a DNA mutagen. It was localized to the X chromosome. And uh, remember that the X chromosome is a sex chromosome in people, just like it is in flies. So that makes it um, somewhat easier to find mutations in, in flies that have uh, mutations on the X chromosomes. And in addition to that first fly that he found in that, in that 200th bottle, he was able, over the course of about 2,000 bottles, to find two other genes that were also showing um, differences in rhythmicity. He was able to take those, those three mutant lines and cross them together and map the genes out and determine that all three mutations were all mutations of the same gene. He called that gene period. So I have a couple graphs here showing some of the, the uh, research that he did. You can, this, the first one on this side is eclosion rhythms. You can see here that every day we've got a peak of eclosion in the morning, morning to midday. The first fly line he found and it turned out to be arrhythmic. You can see there that the eclosion happens at all times of day. It's a very distinctly different graph from the top normal case. He was also able to find a short period mutant where the clock in that fly seemed to run a little faster than normal. Uh, if you compare the peaks, you can still see there's a rhythm here, but if you compare the peaks to the normal, you can see they're coming in a little bit ahead of where the normal should be. And then he also found a long period mutant, where if you look where the peaks on that one are, they're still rhythmic, but they're coming in a little bit behind the normal period. So here there's only three peaks that show up over the same time period where the normal period has four. So very interesting that he was able to find that. Uh, that was in the explosion rhythms, which like I said, are a once a lifetime event for these flies. He was also able to look at individual flies and see what effect these mutations had on their behavior. So flies are going to be active mostly during the day. They'll move around. And then at night, they don't really sleep per se, but they stand still and rest. And what he did was took a, well, invented a machine that had a series of glass tubes. And he would put one fly in each little glass tube. And each glass tube had a beam of light going across the middle of it, infrared light so the flies couldn't see it. And every time the fly was walking across that tube and broke the beam of light, it made a little tick on the recording paper. You can see here in this first case how there's periods of activity followed by periods of rest, and that that happens in a rhythmic fashion. In the second case, looking at this arrhythmic mutant that was eclosing um, without any apparent rhythm, that they're active 
all times of the night and day. And then also for the short and long period mutant, uh, just like we saw with the eclosion, we've got activity that runs on a shorter period and activity that runs on a longer period. And all this, if I didn't mention it before, is all happening in constant darkness. So they're not being cued by anything external. So that's the indication that, that this is truly a biological phenomenon. So the short period mutant was about 19 hours. The long period mutant was about 28 hours. And I'll just I'll make a little side note. When this work was being done, most of the technical work that for doing the... Uh, behavioral assays and building the machines and doing that analysis was actually done by another postdoc in Seymour Benzer's lab who was working with Ron Kanapka. But when they were getting ready to do all the publication of this, that other postdoc basically sat back and said, you know, I, I can't believe that a single gene is going to impact the behavior of an animal. And he said he didn't want to be on that paper. And I would say, you know who that person was? And probably no, none of you do, and, and I don't either. <laughs> Just to show you that, that uh, and sometimes you actually have to take a little leap of faith. So step two for winning your Nobel Prize, grab the brass ring. So a lot of scientists were riding on that, that science carousel and having a great time and, and being very successful, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But to really be at the very top of your game, uh, as a scientist, you have to the prize out there and then really go for it because it's going to be that that focus that, that is going to uh, you know drive the research forward do really good work and hopefully end up in a nobel prize so we'll fast forward now about 12 years to 1983 ron kanapka is still working in circadian rhythms and he was able to show that period has to be in the head of an animal in order to make that animal rhythmic uh, kind of makes sense looking back on it, but if the rhythms are happening in the body, uh, that doesn't necessarily say that, that all the period has to be all over the body. He did that in some, some interesting experiments where he was able to have the fly's head carry the mutant gene while the body carried a normal gene. And if, he, if the gene, if it was an arrhythmic head on a normal fly body, then the whole fly was arrhythmic. Jeff Hall, um, his comment on these, on these genes was that these mutants, in principle, were pure gold. And um, it's been a tradition in the fly community to share the flies that you have. Uh, it's when you get an interesting mutant line, you, it's, you share it, but it's not always going to be that way, and, and it's, it's really not always that way now, because these mutants can be worth a lot of money and a lot of interest. And if you work really hard for many years making a mutant line, you may not want to give it away right away. Ron Kanapka... Um, all about the science, very generous with his mutants. He, he gave them away for free to anybody who asked. So meanwhile, now in the early 80s, this is uh, about 10 years after period was first found, Dr. Hall is studying Drosophila courtship, which he was interestingly found that period also had a role in. Uh, it's a whole different story that we won't get into today. Uh, one tidbit, though, about, about uh, Jeff Hall, just as a kind of personal thing about him, one of the genes he was studying at that time was called fruity. And the, the fruity phenotype for these flies was that they didn't try to mate with female flies. The males didn't try to mate with female flies. They showed a lot more interest in the male fly. Uh, Jeff thought that, that, that calling the gene fruity was kind of um, derogatory. And so he single-handedly changed the name of the gene from fruity to fruitless. Uh, that was, it's, it's ridiculously hard to change the name of a gene once it's already been published, but he felt very strongly about that particular situation and did what he needed to do. And if you look in the literature now, it's, it's called fruitless everywhere. So good for him for standing up what he believed in. Uh, Dr. Ross Bash studying molecular biology and yeast. Molecular biology at this point is a very young science, and yeast is interesting because it's more complex than a lot of people give it credit for. You can do a lot of work in yeast that, that can be scaled up to apply to flies or people. So working on some very interesting tools there. And Dr. Young is studying the genetics of Drosophila development using molecular tools. Um, you know, at the time, he said that, that uh, coming out of his postdoc, you could get a job anywhere if you just showed a slide of some genes in molecular biology. And then uh, and that, was, that was really all you needed to write your ticket. And apparently he did. So, the one thing that all three of these lawyers had in common was that they were able to apply different expertise to a novel field of research. So they, they, they saw something that was interesting out there, is that those period mutants that were pure gold, and they were able to then take 
cutting edge genetics and molecular biology tools and put it toward that problem. And it was the really the foresight to combine the tools with the problem that was able to drive their success. So step three to getting your Nobel Prize, have smart friends and smart enemies. Well, rivals, we'll say. Um, having smart friends is just critically important. As I said before, science isn't done in a vacuum. And you've already, you already know you need to stand on the shoulders of giants. But you also need to have people around you that are going to, to drive you to succeed, that are going to be great ones that you can ask for help, you can ask questions, you can ask advice. And people who you're, are going to encourage you to do your best, and who you can encourage to do their best. And it's that, that kind of collaboration, the, the cross-pollination of ideas that, is, that drives the field forward. So in the early 1980s, Dr. Hall and Dr. Ross Bash, uh, they did a lot of things together, uh, including playing basketball together in a pickup game at Brandeis. So it was in the, the locker room after a game, well, after many games, where Jeff Hall was trying to convince Dr. Ross Bash to apply the molecular tools that Dr. Ross Bash was using, but a yeast, to the genetic problem that Dr. Hall was working on in Drosophila. So finally, um, Jeff Hall is nothing if not persistent, convinced uh, Dr. Rossbash to give it a try, and Mike Rossbash put the odds of success at about 50-50 at the time. But he thought that was good enough that the problem was interesting enough that he would move forward with it. Um, Jeff Hall was also still close with Ron Kanopka, so there was a lot of help there working on, on the questions where, um, for example, when, when uh, Jeff Hall would, would get flies that he thought might be rhythmic, he would take them and mail them all up to Ron Kanapka, where he was studying, and not tell them anything about these flies. Just say, you know, here's a bunch of flies, one through a hundred. Go ahead and run them through experiments, and then send, you know, tell me what you think is rhythmic. And then there was a sort of totally blind study that were uh, very useful when they worked. Um, students and postdocs rose to the challenge here. I'll just I'll point out for anybody who's not actively involved in research that a research lab is run by somebody, but they, they aren't often on the bench doing the actual wet work themselves. It's the students and the postdocs that are doing a lot of the day-to-day -day work. Um, you notice in, in 1971, when I talked about Ron Kanapka you know, checking these fly bottles all the time, he was working in the lab with Seymour Benzer, but I don't think that Dr. Benzer was, was always getting up to look at the bottles himself. So that, that's part of it, is to try to have smart students and postdocs who are going to be clever and do the work and drive the experiments forward themselves. So finally, 1984, 13 years after the gene was first isolated, the period gene was cloned. And that cloning happened independently by Mike Young and the Hall Bash collaboration. And that was, they, they, two labs were working on this question essentially independently. And it wasn't until only earlier in 1984 that the two labs heard that they were each working on it. And when they learned that they were each working on the same question, the race was on. Because really, if, if you could spend five years cloning a period gene, nobody cares if you got the percentage. I mean, the information is already out there. So it, this was a big deal for both groups. And both groups got their publications out within about two weeks of each other, right at the very end of 1984. So hugely exciting now because before I talked about um, the period gene being the genetics that drives the behavior. Now we've got the actual sequence of DNA. We've got the, the piece of DNA that can make that happen. And the experiment that proved that was really dramatic. Because we had these flies, the, these arrhythmic period flies, that were active really nearly all times of day or night. And then we had this little piece of DNA now that was cloned out, uh, We meaning all this that happened by them. I wasn't involved in this at all. Uh, the scientists were able to take that little piece of DNA that they had isolated that contained the period gene and inject it into these flies that were arrhythmic. And then that gene was able to integrate itself into the genome of the arrhythmic flies. And the progeny that were born of those flies were arrhythmic again. And that's and it's just, I, it blows me away every time I talk about it. Because you're able to take a little piece of DNA, a little, little fragment of a molecule, and put that into a living animal and change the behavior of that living animal. It's, it's a really profound piece of biology that, that, uh, that they did. <laughs>
And so now that we've got the gene in hand, we have the tools that we need to unlock the molecular workings of the clock. And this is where the pace of things really starts picking up. So we'll take a little digression right now, molecular biology 101, mm -hmm. for people who, who aren't as familiar. Three main points to molecular biology. First, DNA holds the genetic code. So DNA, well, it's represented here by that blue. Um, you can think of that as the, your, the cookbook that your grandma has on her bookshelf. So this diagram here, the blue box represents the cell. The white in the middle represents the nucleus of the cell. DNA, which is the cookbook, lives in the nucleus. RNA holds the instructions to make proteins. So RNA is made from DNA. And you can think of that as um, your grandma writing out one of her favorite recipes that she's ready to send on to you. And then that RNA leaves the nucleus goes out into the cell, and the RNA then can make protein. And protein, it's the part of the cell that, that really does things. So for example, proteins are involved in making RNA, or proteins can make more proteins. They can stay in the cell. They can leave the cell. It's the proteins that are actually out there doing the work. You can think that of a protein as the meal that you made from the recipe that you got from your grandma's cookbook. So that's the, the three things that, in the nutshell, remember DNA, makes RNA, RNA makes proteins, because a lot of the other stuff we'll talk about is going to key off of all that. And uh, if you can remember that, you can go home and tell your molecular biologist. <laughs> so step four to getting, getting your Nobel Prize is get the word out. Um, I've said a number of times that science doesn't happen in a vacuum. And it's really important that while you read other people's research to learn from it, you also need to let other people know what you're doing. Because, you know, if there's somebody out there right now that has the cure for cancer that they developed in their basement and they don't tell anybody that they have it, then you know, what's the use? They, they might as well not have done it. You've got to get the word out to let people know what's going on. So molecular biology lets us figure out the inner workings of the gene. Finally, we've got tools that we can figure out with this little piece of DNA that we know can rest restore rhythmicity. You know, how does it work? How is it doing what, it, what it's doing? And so uh, these researchers really went on a publishing tear to uh, tell people everything they could learn about it. So with publications, I said not only can you share results, but you also get funding. Because there's a limited pool of money available to do research, and research is not cheap to do. So the people who are giving money out to the researchers want to give it to the researchers who are going to actually produce the results. And the way that a, a fairly good way to decide who's going to give good results is to look at who has done good research in the past. You know, if you've got a proven track record, then you're more likely to get money to continue to do what you do. So publications are very important for the funding. And uh, just as a side note, that's what I do for a career now, is work in publications, helping people publish their information out there to, to get it out. I'm not actively doing research anymore myself, but I am helping get that research out there more effectively for people who are doing the, the uh, frontline work. So looking at publications between 1984 and 1999, which is really the, the heyday of the molecular clock research, Jeff Hall had 67 publications over those 15 years dealing just with circadian biology. Um, and circadian biology for Jeff Hall was only about half of what he was working on. He still kept, kept his whole courtship and, and mating behavior uh, going on at that point as well. But just circadian, he had 67 publications. Mike Rossbash had 58. 41 of those publications being co-authored with Jeff Hall uh, as part of their collaboration. Mike Young, over that same time, had 28 papers, with one of them being co-authored with uh, Mike Rossbash. Interestingly, uh, Jeff Hall and Mike Young never co-authored a paper together. So between the three of them, over those 15 years, they published 111 distinct papers. So about 7.5 papers coming out on this topic per year. And it's, you know, come, that's, that's a ridiculous pace of knowledge that's getting thrown out there just from these, these three labs. And they weren't the only three labs that were working on anything circadian related. But they were the two main drivers of circadian rhythm research in this organism. And the, the amount, the, the, the prolific publications they had is, is unreal. Not every publication was a, a groundbreaking piece of exciting research. 
which is always that exciting necessarily. It could be, you know, a description of a control element or something that might not be on the front page of the New York Times, but it's still very important work that is going to let other people build off of that. Also, right around this time in, in uh, very, very early 90s, the National Science Foundation established a Center for Biological Timing, and that raised about $15 million, a good chunk of money. Uh, it was for a 10-year project that was a joint collaboration between the University of Virginia, where I was, um, Northwestern University, where there was some good work being done on mice, um, Brandeis University, where Hall and Roshbash were working, and Rockefeller, where Mike Young was working. And the goal of that Center for Biological Timing was to figure out how the clock works in Drosophila, in mice, and in plants. And uh, spoiler alert, it did. worked. <laughs> so we'll go ahead now to 1990, where research showed that period protein and the mRNA, mRNA cycle. So remember, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, protein does things. So this is the first molecular evidence that the gene product cycle with the same frequency as measured behavior. So over here on this side, oh, there. Over there on this side, we've got some RNA results. And you can see here along this line and along that line, uh, those are measuring the period RNA. And this is what time, what time it is. Uh, populations of flies were ground up, and the RNA was Right there, about 4 o'clock 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, starts around 9 or 10, and it drops off by about 8 o'clock at night. And that pattern held every day, and that, was, that pattern also held in constant darkness. So very exciting to show that the RNA that's driven from this gene that we know drives intensity is also showing up in a rhythmic fashion. And in a similar way, proteins were measured, the, the levels of protein were measured, and you can see that the amount of protein uh, is at a minimum right about noon, and then rises up later in the day about 8 or 9 o'clock. So it's about six hours shifted from the RNA profile. So now we've got two molecular markers that we can measure that are showing the same frequency in oscillations as the behavior of the animal. Then in 1992, we were able to show, well, they were able to show that the... Uh, period protein was nuclear. So studies were able to show that period would accumulate in the nucleus. There was, there was some staining out in the, the cytoplasm of the cell, but it was primarily nuclear in these experiments that, that were done here. And that set the stage for some early feedback condition models. So with this molecular biology, we were looking at the gene, but the next thing that we, people want to think about is how is the gene actually working? So with this early model, we've got DNA, that makes RNA. In this case, the RNA is the period RNA, which goes out in the cytoplasm in the early night, and then protein starts getting made from all that RNA. So in the early night, we've got a large concentration of RNA, but not a whole lot of protein. Later on in the night, when all this protein gets made, it goes back into the nucleus. Now the staining that I talked about right here was able to show that. Um, we know that the period protein accumulates about six hours after the period of RNA. So the model that came out of this was that the period protein, when it went into the nucleus, it would somehow block the production of its own RNA. So that starts making the feedback loop, where when there's, when there's not much period protein, the RNA gets made, the RNA then accumulates like we see here, and it makes the protein. Then as the protein accumulates, it moves into the nucleus, and it blocks the production of its own RNA. The RNA over here, after it makes the protein, will degrade, and the protein, after it sits in the nucleus for a little while, will degrade. As that protein degrades, then the restriction on the production of the RNA is lifted, which lets the RNA get made, and the whole cycle goes around. So you, you can see that, that makes for a really exciting model for how the central oscillator might work. Of course, a lot more work had to be done to prove it, which leads to step five for your Nobel Prize, don't be afraid to fail. So it's true in, in this research and uh, for research in general, for the most part, we only hear about the experiments that worked. Um, I can tell you 
from firsthand experience that a lot of research gets done that just doesn't work. And it's, it's uh, part, of, part of playing the game, but uh, that's, that's what it is. So each paper, that, and I talked about that there was a lot of papers published, each paper that's published represents about two to four person years of research. So we've got all these grad students and postdocs that are all working on it. Uh, it's a huge amount of effort to get these papers out. And the students and postdocs create success. They know that if they can find some good discoveries, then they can move on and get better jobs themselves. So they're going to be the ones that are trying new things, um, throwing out a lot of random ideas to see what will happen, and coming in at all hours of the day or night, and in these cases of circadian studies, it's literally all hours of the day or night, because you never know exactly what time something might be going on. So by the mid-1990s, all three laureates, based on the different successes that they and their students had, started to move in different directions. So Jeff Hall was working on tools, more tools for improving the circadian research, also looking at tissues and the control elements for how these different circadian genes, well, period and others, might work. Uh, Mike Ross was working on mechanisms of interactions. He's got that hardcore molecular biology background. So he's looking into mechanisms how interactions might work, and also some looking for additional mutations. And Mike Young, was working on a new, mu new mutation that he called Timeless. So Timeless, found in the mid-1990s, second gene that was found essential for rhythmicity. Uh, studies that took about 20 years for period were only took about two to three years for Timeless. The technology had gotten so much better. Um, not to say it was easy to find Timeless, that Timeless was the primary work of two researchers, two postdocs in his lab. Uh, I said that, that period was found in the the first period was found in 200 bottles of flies, and the other two mutations within about 2,000. These two researchers had to screen 7,000 bottles of flies before they found Timeless. Uh, it's a huge amount of work, but they were able to do it. And then they were able to take all these molecular tools that we use, for, well, that they use for period, and apply them to Timeless also. And they found a lot of really cool stuff, like that the Timeless RNA and protein cycle similarly to period. That Timeless and period proteins would dimerize. They would work together, that timeless is needed to stabilize period, that without, without timeless, then period just won't accumulate. Timeless would need, is needed to move period into the nucleus. You know, if you don't have timeless, then, then what little period there is won't go to the nucleus. And so that leads on to a, a more refined model, where now here in the early night, we've got timeless and period RNA that goes out into the cytoplasm. They make their proteins. Those proteins dimerize into a single functional unit, which then moves into the nucleus and blocks the creation of the timeless and period RNA. So it's the same basic feedback inhibition model that we talked about earlier, but now it's just uh, adding a second player and a little more interaction. But there are still a couple other questions. So two big questions at this point, how does light reset the clock? And how does the period timeless dimer block its own transcription, because it didn't look like, based on molecular sequence, that that was going to be a directly DNA-binding protein group. So we'll move on now to a couple slides about the work that I did with the circadian studies. This is uh, primarily 95 to 97, where it was a collaboration between Jeff Paul, the, the laureate, and Steve Kay, whose lab I worked in in Virginia, uh, Virginia and then Scripps Research Institute. Uh, Steve Kay primarily worked in a plant called Arabidopsis. And he had some really interesting technologies and some interesting tools for measuring circadian outputs uh, and getting a view into the circadian clock. Uh, Jeff Hall had great questions about Drosophila. Um, nobody in Steve's lab knew how to work with flies. Uh, for my undergraduate advisor, I did have good experience in Drosophila. So we were able to all get together, and uh, I jumped in on the project working with the two of them to try to take the, uh, take the questions, to take the tools, put them together. So in brief, what we did was we took the gene from fireflies that makes them glow, called luciferase, and we hooked it up to the control elements for the period gene and then put that into fruit flies. So we ended up with little glowing fruit flies. And these flies would glow brighter or dimmer depending on what time of day the fly thought it was. So we found that the bioluminescence from these flies was rhythmic and that the rhythmic, rhythmicity of the bioluminescence tracked well with the period protein. Uh, a lot of other studies that, that showed that period with 
was uh, or per this way it's time suck. We're great for tracking the molecular clock and single flies. Do you remember before I had talked about doing population work with RNA or protein where you have to grind up large groups of flies? Or uh, we would look at, you know, they, they looked at eclosion which was a population again, or just behavior of a single fly, but that showed an output. What we're looking at here for the first time was status of the molecular clock itself. So you can see over here a picture of one of my glowing flies. Here's the fly head with its eyes, um, very bright in the, in the eye and in the head region. Uh, we've got a wing over here that's got some glowing. We've got a leg down here that's got a few spots that are glowing very brightly. And then I have a graph here and this is monitoring a, a group of flies. Now it averaged out to make a little bit prettier picture. Uh, this is a whole week in constant darkness for these flies, with the exception of the light they're generating themselves, which we were able to show wasn't sufficient to reset the clock. Now uh, you can see here for the flies that have rhythmicity, the wild type period flies that we've got a good 24 hour period, even though they're in constant darkness. And for the flies that were arrhythmic, and these were the glowing flies that we crossed to Ron Kanopka's original period mutation flies, that they don't show any rhythmicity. They've got just a, a single high level of period expression. So the second part of the research we did showed that clocks are everywhere. I said earlier that, that period was essential to be in the fly's head to have overall body rhythmicity. What we did for this work was took the fly, um, chopped it up into in little pieces, and then kept those pieces alive in culture for a week or more. And, uh, and here's four, uh, four graphs. So I, in these particular cases, I took an antenna, a proboscis, a leg, or a wing, and kept those just those individual pieces in culture. You can see that in the light-dark cycles, where the black and white bars, we had very robust rhythmicity. Um, when we went to constant darkness, represented by the black and gray, we still had a few uh, periods of rhythmicity, but then that kind of damped out. We were able to later show it was because individual cells were starting to run out of sync with each other because there was no head to coordinate all these individual cells. And then finally, if we turn, turn the light-dark cycle back on, rhythmicity perked up again. Uh, interestingly, we took this and did it six hours shifted from where it was before, and the uh, individual legs, wings, antennae were able to pick up the new light cycle. So two really interesting things. First, that we had rhythmicity in parts of the body that were completely not attached to the head at all. So that was that was novel that you could have a flat wing, for example, that would show molecular rhythmicity. And the second thing that we're able to show by being able to reset the clock here was that the circadian clock itself was photoreceptive. So up up until now, um, we were able. Well, up until now, it was it was common knowledge that. Light had to come in through the eyes to get into the circadian clock and, and make something happen. But with this leg and with this wing, we could shine light on it and the clock would respond to that light coming from directly on it, even though there's, there's no fly head anywhere within 10 feet of that wing. So that indicated that there is a circadian specific photoreceptor independent of the visual pathway. So moving on now, uh, we're getting toward the end of the molecular story. In 1998, three more circadian genes were found. So in, 19, in the 1970s, molecular biology was just, just getting started. And I say that the 1970s sci-fi is the 1990s reality. And the, the tools that were available to, to us in the late 90s were, you, you know, people in the 70s couldn't even dream of it. And, and I think that that really is holding true now. The, the kind of stuff that we were doing in the 1990s that involving you know, multi-million dollar research facilities is now going on every day right there in the, in the research labs as, as part of the regular undergraduate curriculum. Um, you know, what's going to happen in 20 years from now, I, I can't wait to see that. And work in other organisms, so I said that the Center for Biological Time involved mice and plants also, and uh, genes that were being found in those organisms, when people looked for those in Drosophila, they found them. When they took Drosophila genes and looked for them in other organisms, they found those too. So now all these stories from all these different organisms were starting to converge to make one clock story that really holds true for all sorts of organisms. And so the three other genes, one was called double time that was found to bind to the period protein, and that was the signal to make period degrade. Because remember, if period doesn't degrade, then we can't have that good feedback loop. And we know that double time activity was blocked by timeless. Uh, another one called clock 
is a circadian transcription factor, so it, it binds onto the DNA to help make the RNA, and that mutants in clock were arrhythmic, and they don't produce period or timeless, which indicated that if it's not binding, then period and timeless aren't going to work, aren't going to get made. And one called cycle, uh, another transcription factor that was shown to dimerize with clock. And then finally, some molecular interaction studies showed that the period timeless dimer was able to bind to the clock cycle dimer. And finally, uh, thinking about the inputs and outputs a little bit, cryptochrome, which was originally found in plants, was a blue, well, is a blue light photoreceptor that was found to be in the circadian cells. It was cryptochrome that was able to take my fly legs and wings and let those respond to the light. Um, cryptochrome was shown to dimerize with timeless, and that when cryptochrome was exposed to light, it degraded timeless. So now we've got the molecular mechanism for how light can affect one of the players in the clock and reset the clock cycle. And remember now that timeless is used to stabilize and transport periods, so you can see how that, that all jumps in and all tends to work together. Um, also thinking about outputs, from about 1996 to 2000, there was a handful of genes that were found to show the cycle. But a 2001 study in Mike Young's lab found 158 cycling transcripts just in the fly head alone. So that's an indication that all these, these output transcripts, and, and if, those, if any of those transcripts were, well, if any of those genes that made the transcripts were mutagenized and eliminated, the clock itself still ran. That's how you knew that it was an output. So putting it all together into the, basically the final model that is what the Nobel Committee awarded the prize for. We've got period and timeless that, oh, well, here they're, they're making their RNA that goes out into the cytoplasm, gets turned into the proteins. Uh, proteins will dimerize, go back into the nucleus, and when they grab onto the clock cycle dimer, then that inactivates the production of their RNA, it, which basically carries the cycle around that I had talked about before. Uh, we've also got the input here going to cryptochrome, which will eliminate timeless, which um, destabilizes this dimer, which gets everything all this degraded, which means that it can't go in and block itself. Uh, we've also got clock and cycle when they're not being blocked by period and timeless, they can make all these little output transcripts. And that's just some of the 158. So this kind of really summarizes all together the, the 15 years of molecular work and the, the 25 years of circadian biology work overall that the Nobel Prize Committee felt was worthy of this, this great contribution. So that brings to the final step, stay alive. I said that, that you had to be alive to get your Nobel Prize. Uh, two people who unfortunately didn't stay alive long enough were Seymour Benzer, who was a, a very prolific scientist. Um, he, had, he, he would tend to work in about 10-year chunks where he would focus on something for about 10 years and basically for those 10 years own it and then get bored and move on to something else. Um, he did that for about six decades, ranging from physics to... Uh, you know, phage biology to cancer biology to behavior, really an amazing guy. And then Ron Kanapka, who was, he was concerned about the science primarily. Um, if it wasn't a great story, he didn't, he didn't want to publish it. He wanted to be sure. Uh, unfortunately, that, that didn't always work out real well in a, a publisher parish kind of environment. So he never really got the credit that, that a lot of people feel he deserved. Um, there's some, you know, if you want to be cynical, you could say that, that these two were also deserving of being mentioned the Nobel Prize. But, you know, since without them, the period gene wouldn't have been found in the first place, which really set the groundwork for, for everything else. Um, it was about, well, 15 to 17 years between when the, the clock story really finished up and when these Nobel Prizes were awarded this year. Uh, if you wanted to be cynical, you could say that the Nobel Committee had appreciated for many years the impact of this work, but they just had to wait for enough of the people involved to die to bring it down to three to, to get the Nobel Prize. Um, I, I, don't have any, I don't have any insight to that or not, but just throwing it out as kind of a, a grisly possibility. So where are they now? Jeff Hall, right here. Uh, he retired to Maine in about 2008. He unfortunately got kind of disillusioned with the whole funding process and the whole, the whole uh, cutthroat publish and perish attitude. So in about 2008, he gave it up, went to Maine, and he's a Civil War expert. Uh, even when he was at Brandeis, just because 
the Civil War caught his interest, he really focused on that too. He could focus on as many things he wanted. And uh, he was teaching, in addition to teaching in the biology department there, he was also teaching history classes at Brandeis. And uh, still sometimes, if, if you're lucky, you can wander around the Gettysburg battlefield, which is his particular area of expertise, and you'll see a, a, a short, older man with a bullhorn that'll yell at anybody who will listen about Gettysburg facts, because he knows it, knows a lot. <laughs> And Mike Young, still at Rockefeller, still has an active research program there. He's also been uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs at Rockefeller since 2004. So some of the future directions, they're the legacy of these three Nobel laureates. Uh, I had talked about being about seven, seven and a half papers on average published in, in uh, these three labs, or from these three labs while the, the research is going on. In 2017, there's about 3,000 circadian papers that have been published. So you can see the fields have exploded. Not all of these papers are going to be about the core part of the biology, but just about other things that are affected by the circadian rhythms. It's, you know, circadian rhythms, like I started out by saying, are in virtually every organism in which we cared to look. And it's the outputs that, that control that that are really being shown to be important all around. There are still some important questions about the molecular part of the clock, not you know, taking the outputs out of the equation for a second. So for example, how does temperature compensation work? We know that that, that's important. It doesn't, we don't need a thermometer, we need a clock. But there hasn't really been any definitive answer for how temperature compensation works in the clock. Um, also, about other, um, there's also other input pathways. So, I talked about how studies had shown that you need light to come in through the eyes to get to the molecular clock. Um, that pathway isn't, isn't totally clear. Uh, there's also other input pathways, such as, as temperature cycles or feeding cycles, that all have some, some bearing and that aren't really well understood. There's a lot of promising new research, cancer and chemotherapy. Uh, chemotherapy drugs have been shown to have different efficacy depending on what time of day they might be given. Uh, for obesity and diabetes, we know that metabolism varies throughout the day. There's some really cool studies that were done in mice, where if you have mice and if you have two mice, you feed them both the exact same number of calories in a day, but one mouse you feed them all throughout the day, and the other mouse you feed them only at limited times, the amount of fat that those mice accumulate is different even though they had the exact same number of calories. It's just all on when they eat, depending on how much fat they eat. Uh, some very interesting questions there for, for things like obesity and weight loss. And finally, circadian influences on mood and the reward pathways. There's some, some interesting inter potential interactions that are being shown there that have uh, potential impacts on things like mental illness or addiction. And finally, there's some uncomfortable ethical questions that, that I'll bring up on genes and behavior. I talked about in the beginning how, how inherently cool I think it is that you can take a little piece of DNA and put that into an animal and affect its whole behavior, not only of that animal, well, of that animal's children, but that's children's children, and bring it on down through there. In flies, it's fairly easy to say that they, they move around in the day and they rest at night. But since so much of the work that's done in flies also applies to higher animals all the way up to people, it's not out of the question that there, there could be research done, and there is, in fact, research going on now looking at people's behavior and personality traits and some genetic ties to that. So if you have genes that, in people, we know affect a certain behavior, then it's not a stretch to say that work could be done to either enhance or eliminate those behaviors from the population. So with those six steps, the final thing is to book your ticket to stop. Uh, you can go have a, a wonderful, amazing banquet. You can get to meet the king and queen of Sweden. Uh, you get your prize, and you get famous. So hope you all have the tools that you need now to go out and get Nobel Prizes of your own, and uh, hope that you've got a better understanding of really the amazing work that we So I can see that my biological timing today was pretty poor, and I didn't leave a whole lot of time for questions, but we could maybe do one or two if we've, if we've got a little bit of time left. In the general sense, 
Sure. Well, they, um, the, so they, they, get all their, they put out the call for nominations, and these scholars from all over the world, although primarily concentrated in Scandinavia, send their recommendations into the Nobel Committee. And the Nobel Committee uh, takes those recommendations, splits it out into smaller subcommittees that looks at the, at the different prizes. And then they're able to assemble from that a small number. The exact number probably varies and isn't said. And then um, for those individual researchers or projects, um, they get farmed out to experts in the field who do extensive amounts of research to try to show why the work they did was novel and impactful. And then when they've got that, that set, then all that research goes back to the committee where they all discuss it and then the committees will actually talk amongst each other because it could be that, for example, if somebody is working in biochemistry, you don't want to give them the, the medicine prize and the chemistry prize in the same year. So they'll make sure they don't have duplications like that. And uh, somehow the committee talks it over internally and they decide. And it, it's likely that the same person or people or projects might get nominated many times over many years and all that nomination research all goes into that file. So if somebody gets nominated three years in a row, the person in the third year still gets to look at the work that was, the research work that was done in the first and second year supporting that nomination. But it's all kind of a black box as far as the nom nominating stuff goes, and all the nomination records are sealed for 50 years. So it isn't a public process? It is not a public process at all. It is done by, by these committees, closed doors. How do they select people to be on the committee? So the selection of, of committee members is done by, it's, it's part of the, I don't, I, I don't know off the top of my head if it's Swedish or Scandinavian Academy of Sciences. And uh, so they, they have the smaller committee, uh, that committee that sends out the nominations to about, or the nominating forms to about 3,000 scholars who the committee thinks is worthy of doing that. And, uh, I, as far as I know, um, getting a Nobel Prize doesn't give, doesn't give you any particular influence into the committee other than being a permanent nominating uh, person to send your nominations in. Yeah. Uh, someone who is a horse lover told me recently that most foals are born about, well, during the night, but about 3 a.m. because from, a, from the point of view of the horse, the, the young has to be able to be up and running by daybreak in order to escape predators. Do you know of any such, uh, are you aware of any such uh, circadian birth? Um, I, I haven't heard anything about that, but it makes total sense because we, we know that, that these uh, circadian clocks, they, they exist to provide a, uh, an adaptive advantage. And obviously, if uh, if your offspring aren't getting eaten, then, then you've got a better chance of, of passing those genes along. That's a, a really interesting example of, of this uh, being shown in a practical sense. What is he doing now? So, <laughs> I think, uh, so now I'm working in, in the business of science publishing, and my, my current job is to work with the publishers where all these publications that I talked about where they're, they're putting their information out there. Um, I work with the publishers, not on posting new articles on a day-to-day -day basis, but trying to figure out how to more effectively communicate scientific information that these journals are publishing out to the, the general public. So for anybody that reads scientific literature, if you ever read something and, and you say, boy, you know, that's, that's presented in a really lousy way. Let me know, because I would like to make it better. Jeff, has anyone looked at the effects of melatonin on some of these circadian rhythm-associated genes? Absolutely. So, so melatonin is, is um, definitely shown to be very influential in the clock, where you can have, you've got uh, naturally occurring rising and falling levels. Uh, there's, there's some, some studies that have indicated that taking oral melatonin might help with resetting the clock. Uh, for if you have jet lag, for example, or if you're working in shift work, or if you're just having, having trouble falling asleep. Um, I don't know specifically how melatonin might, might uh, get in there and work with the circadian clock, but it, it's definitely a player, and that's definitely a big area for research, because you look at things like, like jet lag or shift work, where uh, it's not only the, the productivity 
loss that you might have from those, but also thing, things like health and safety and just personal comfort. So it's, it's not only an interesting question, but it's also potentially a big business question. Yes? I used to work just uh, way back in the business of mm -hmm. And I know more recently, there's been a lot of work done on looking at trying to figure out what is the best shift cycle that, uh, let's say, an oil refinery or a chemical plant. Sure. Or, uh, is, that, is, that, is anybody come to any conclusions on that, as what, what the best shift cycle is? Um, the best is a relative term because there, there are, uh, just, just like there, there's fly mutants that, that run a little bit longer or shorter, there's also uh, mutant, uh, I hate, hate to make it sound bad, but mutant people that, that have, uh, and you might, you might know some of them, you might be some of them. There, there's people just naturally that, that are, are more perky in the morning or more perky at night. It's, you know, the, the day larks and the night owls. And so, so the optimal cycle for shift work is going to be dependent on individual people. But yeah, there has been a lot of a lot of research done into trying to find exactly uh, when the right research is, is being done, uh, when the when when the right uh, when when people are, are going to be at their prime, because that's when you want something that that's somewhat related to that. Uh, a friend of mine who is who is still working in circadian rhythms, uh, she she's a mother now with children in grade school. And based on research that she and other people did, they found that, and this is probably not a surprise to anybody who, who's been a parent, but that children like to sleep in. And so they, and they, they were able to show that, that the sleeping in is really an, an adolescence kind of thing. So it'll, it'll start kicking in nine or 10 and then, then go through the teen years. And she was, based on that research, she was able to work with the local school boards and push back the start time of school for, by about half an hour. And uh, with the, the idea that that's going to be better off. Um, and some of the shift work research some of that kicked off in World War II when there were fighting units that their job was to go out and, and fight at night. And so they were, they were sleeping, uh, sleeping all day and getting out and training all night so that when they had to go into battle and do the real thing, um, they, they were fresh. And hopefully the people they were fighting against weren't quite as fresh because they hadn't had that training. 